So, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Anton Sabin. I'll be sharing this uh, industry keynote session where we are very happy to have Terry Blevins with us. So, he's with uh, Emerson Process Management in the US. And as you see here, we'll talk about the future challenges, solutions, and systems in automatic control. And um, Eric's been, among other things, leading the development of the Delta V Advanced Control products. He's uh, written books, papers, and has 60 patents, maybe even more. <laughs> and he's a member of uh, Control Magazine's Process Automa Automation Hall of Fame, and he's also an ISA uh, fellow. So we are very happy to have you here, and uh, welcome. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Uh, the topic of this presentation is uh, automatic control, and as you might sense, that's a pretty broad, uh, broad subject. Uh, I'll be talking about automatic control from the perspective of control systems that are currently being installed in the process industry, that is within refineries, within pulp and paper mills, within pharmaceutical manufacturing plants, the, the control systems that are really producing many of the products that you use every day in your life. Uh, so I, I hope you find this interesting. I've tried to tailor the topic uh, to areas where event-based control is actually being used very successfully within the uh, process industries. So I'll uh, be focusing on that in, in the discussion. Uh, so for the agenda, I wanted to start out as an, with an introduction, talking about areas where event-based control is currently being applied within the process industries. Uh, I'll then shift over to an area that's evolving. You know, if you look at it from a research standpoint, it introduces a number of interesting topics that I, I think you'll find of, of help maybe if you're looking at ways uh, control could be applied within this industry. In particular, I'll be looking at uh, this concept of procedural automation of um, continuous processes. And uh, so we'll be focusing a lot on that, talking about some of the uh, challenges in applying uh, procedural automation in a continuous process and uh, be talking about some of the uh, new technologies that allow us to do a little bit better job in addressing that area, but uh, there are many areas that are still yet to be addressed, so we'll uh, be talking about that. If you uh, compare today's control system to one maybe five or ten years ago, you'll see quite a bit of differences within the control system. You know, these uh, major plants that produce uh, your oil and your gas uh, your products, those plants are run from a control room where a few people run this massive uh, plant. And they do it mainly through automation. Uh, if a person had to do it manually in terms of making adjustments, they really wouldn't be able to run the entire plant. In this area of uh, user interface, uh, the controllers that are behind that automation we've seen significant changes. And a lot of that has come about due to more and more powerful processors, more memory, higher speed of communication. And that's resulted in the systems that we have today. Uh, standards actually have played quite a role in terms of some aspects of control. And I'll be talking a little bit about that uh, today. There are a number of areas, though, that I'll be pointing out that deserve more research and development, and uh, so we'll be touching base on that. If you think about the, um, the industry, that is, the process industries, um, usually when you think about control systems, you think about is it being applied in a continuous process or a batch process. A continuous process would be one where the feedstock of the plant is coming in and it's just continually processed through heating, mixing, reaction to produce a product. So there is really no stopping other than the shutdown of the plant. It's just running continuously. 
Whereas in a batch uh, type uh, operation, which would be used uh, a lot within your pharmaceutical industry, especially chemical industry, you're processing in steps, discrete steps, versus continuous processing. So if you look at it from that perspective, then about a little over 70% of the systems that are being installed are going into continuous process plants, that is continuous operation. Sort of depends on the survey you look at as to the number, but a little over 72%. Within batch, a little over maybe 15% of the market is batch. But one of the things you find is, is that in all your manufacturing plants, uh, you'll find that there's a mixture of both batch and continuous processing. So even though batch is the smaller part, it, it's important because you'll find it in almost all plants. And in the area of batch, uh, a number of advances have been made within the last 10 or 15 years that really have advanced the capability and the way control, batch control is done. So remarkable things have been done in that area in terms of improvement of batch operations. And this has come about primarily due to the fact that there is a standard ISA 88 or the equivalent IEC 61512 standard that standardizes procedural automation for batch processes. So that, that's what this standard addresses. There's a companion standard that addresses um, a batch automation at the enterprise level. Like uh, if you're a major pharmaceutical company, you may be manufacturing pharmaceuticals in multiple locations and coordination between those locations, the enterprise type of control will be defined by 95 at the plant level it's pretty well covered by just the IS-88 standard. So these standards then have been adopted by most of your manufacturers. So if you look at an ABB system or one from Emerson or one from Siemens, uh, all of us provide that capability. And our customers benefit from that because then they have a standard way of approaching batch applications. Now, one of the things that uh, happened in the IS-88 standard is, is that that effort was led by a fellow by the name of Tom Fisher, who was from Lubrizol. And Lubrizol is a specialty chemical manufacturer. And Tom had just years and years of experience doing batch applications using a variety of platforms. So he's a wonderful leader of that effort and most people credit him you know, with the success of that standard. But there are many other people that also contributed from industry to the standard itself. The approach they took was not to tell you down to the implementation level how you had to do things, but they standardized the, uh, the actual terminology that is used in describing a batch process. Because until this time, depending upon the manufacturer, depending upon the user, they're using terms in a very inconsistent way, which made for a lot of problems in terms of trying to define a control system, implement a control system. So the standard itself defines uh, terminology. Also, one of the things it did was define a physical model for your uh, process. At the upper levels of the physical process in terms of implementation, the batch operation, uh, that's described with a, what's called a procedural model. And at the upper layers of the physical layer, that procedure is implemented using sequential function chart. Now, a sequential function chart basically is totally event-driven. That is, in a batch operation, you may be initially feeding materials to, say, a, a unit where you're going to be doing mixing. So you may turn on some pumps for a while. At uh, some point, you may hit some level in a tank. That event triggers you stopping the pump, doing something else. So it's totally event triggered. And within the SFC, you have to handle failures. That is, something doesn't reach a level. It should have, but maybe the level measurement no longer is working. And so there has to be the knowledge built in 
in terms of how to handle failures, how to uh, allow the operator to interact in this event-driven environment where he can take over at any point if he needs to in terms of the automation to, to uh, continue on. At the uh, lower level, at what was called the control module, that is normally implemented using function blocks. This is your basic I.O. measurements that is bringing in the measurements from the process, the actuation going out to it, and the base level analog equivalent control within your control system. So this is sort of the heart of the continuous control. This is handling all the sequencing that is required in a batch operation. Now then, there's a need to have a consistent interface between this function block world and the sequential function block. And that is defined by defined by the IEC 1804 uh, standard. That's your international standard for function blocks for the process industry. So that is the standard that people follow. In the standard itself, it defines a parameter called mode. The mode itself is used to select the source of the set point. Is it provided by an operator? Is it provided by the sequencing that you're doing in an SFC? Uh, is it provided by the operator? Or is the output to be determined by the algorithm? Or is it to be manually set by the sequence or by an operator? So all that's determined by one parameter called mode. The other thing that's standardized is the fact that your measurements themselves provide not only the measurement value, but also something called status, which is the quality of the measurement. Is it good or bad? So if you think about it, if you're trying to automate something in terms of sequencing, a knowledge of how good is your measurement, is it good or bad, and being able to have a consistent interface where you can interface to the control through your sequencing, it's uh, defined by the standard. In an implementation of batch control, then you'll have information that's coming from your field devices. So you'll be measuring and then actuating valves themselves. Also, in most of your modern systems today, the safety system is tied in some way into the control system. The safety system is there to shut down the plant in case of a fault that could cause a safety issue or problem in the plant. So this safety system can also provide information to this sequencing that's going on. And now then that we have wireless devices also, you'll see that tied into most control systems where you can use it as part of your uh, sequencing that you're doing. Now in batch applications, uh, the batch itself, that is the production of a product from start to end, can be usually a very short period of time. You may have a, a short a period as a few hours in terms of the batch production. In a, say, specialty chemical, your batch may be two days in duration, but it's a relatively short period of time between you starting and ending the batch. And therefore, it's pretty easy to justify the fact that all the blocking valves that are associated with the process that are used to isolate lines and vessels uh, can be totally automated. That is, the control system can open and close those blocking valves. So because of that, then a batch operation can, in many cases, be totally automatic. That is, all the way from the start, all the way to the finish, can be done with no human interaction or intervention. So uh, that, that's the level of automation that has been achieved. So you say, well, what, what remains in this area uh, for improvement? Well, one of the biggest areas for improvement is the fact that in many cases you cannot measure the property of the material you actually produced. That is, you're in a batch environment, you're maybe making a product and has certain product specifications. You really can't buy an online analyzer that tells you what those properties are. So if you think about it, here you have a batch application where you've processed some material for the last two days and you just finished your batch. At that point in time, what happens is a grab sample is taken, 
It goes to a lab where there are analyzers that can be used offline to analyze it. And you find out you either made the right product or you didn't make the right product. Now, in processing, all sorts of things can happen. Uh, there can be failures of measurements, unmeasured disturbances like rainstorms, other things that, that are going to impact the final product that you make. And so this is a little bit of an issue of I can't really know what I made until I made it. And at that point in time, it's a little too late to go back and say, I wish I could have adjusted things in my batch, right? So this is an area which uh, stands for improvement. And in many cases, unfortunately, you find that the lab system itself is not even tied into the control system. So the access of that information along with the process information you may not have it within the same database or the same environment. So that, that can be an issue in many cases. Now, one of, the, one of the ways of addressing that issue is through the application of analytics. And, you know, we've all heard about analytics in terms of the web and what Google and other people are doing with analytics in terms of analyzing transactions, like when you purchase something or do something, right? When you start talking about applying analytics in this environment, you're talking about real-time data, batch or continuous data, that uh, the tools you need to use for analysis of that are, are different. Uh, but in the batch world, there's been quite a bit of work in this, and manufacturers are now starting to actually apply some of this. And basically the idea is, is that you take a historian most, most of these control systems have some ability to collect the data in terms of all your measurements, all your actuations of valves, uh, to collect that into a historian. And if you're fortunate enough and the lab is tied in, then the lab information will also be in there. Assuming you have all the information within a historian, then you can then from that develop something called multi-way models, multi-way PCA, multi-way PLS models. So you're basically applying some uh, mathematical tools here in terms of analyzing that. And based upon the models that you create, and then the real-time information as the batch actually executes, you can get a real-time estimate of the final product quality as the batch is actually being processed. So this is a tool that most operators have never had, that is to know beforehand that they've got a problem. And oftentimes, if you know you've got a problem, you can maybe make corrections to adjust it so you still hit the properties you want at the end of the batch. So this opens up a new world for the operator in terms of viewing and seeing what's going on. Also, through these techniques, you can identify faults within the process and indicate uh, those being maybe the source of this deviation in your quality parameter. So uh, this is something that's a pretty exciting area. It's one that a number of manufacturers are working in, and you'll see more and more about this in the future. But uh, there's still improvements that can be made in terms of this. Now, in terms of structuring these analysis tools, <clears throat> one thing that IS88 did for us was say that in analyzing your process, you can break it into something called stages. As a batch, progresses, it may actually go through different pieces of equipment. The actual I.O., the actual measurements that are available for this stage of your batch may be totally different than the measurements you're using on the other stage. So your analysis tools need to take all that into account. And basically what is possible is to develop a model by stage and switch from one stage to the other in terms of the analysis as you as the batch progresses. So that's a really nice tool. Now, in terms of reducing the dimensionality of the problem using principal component analysis, you can uh, reduce the uh, scope of, of the measurements that are required. 
And uh, as you're quite aware that uh, many of the measurements within a batch application are highly correlated. You know, as something changes on the feed rate, it may change the temperature, it may change the density, it may change a number of things. So things are not independent in that area. And through principal component analysis, you can boil it down to the key drivers of your process. And then by applying a little bit of uh, statistical tools, uh, the two that are mainly used are Houghton Telling's t squared statistic and this mean uh, predi uh, squared prediction error, SPA. So using those, we can then determine fault conditions within the process. So just an example of that okay, is, uh, is a bioreactor. So this is something you might find in pharmaceutical. In pharmaceutical, you're basically dealing with live cells within one of these uh, bioreactors, and they're very sensitive to the pH. If the pH gets too far out of range, the bugs die, that is the cells die. So uh, if we took a case where maybe the pH sensor was faulty, that that is, maybe it had coated over or, and uh, was broken. Then by applying analytics to that, when a fault actually occurs, there is an indication of that by looking at, at these uh, two statistics there, T squared and Q statistic. When it deviates above a certain value, and, and most manufacturers are sort of normalizing where anything above a value of one says you've got something going on that needs attention, then uh, you know you have a problem, and then by looking at the things that contributed to that, you can then determine, is it my measurement that's broken, or is there something else that is causing this problem within my process? So again, you're giving uh, the person that's running the plant information that he just doesn't have today. And so the challenge in this area is to make these tools easy to implement, and easy to use for the operator. So there, there's a real uh, need for improvement in both of those areas. And manufacturers are working on that. You know, we have a saying that it's really easy to make something hard, or it's really hard to make something easy. And this is one of those areas where you really uh, need more work. If we look at the continuous process area, most of the focus over the last 20 years has been on the normal operation of your plant. That is, normal operations, how do I improve throughput, how do I decrease variations in key parameters of my process. One of the most uh, successful tools in terms of addressing continuous uh, applications, these large interactive processes like a distillation column, uh, reactor, other units like that, is a model predictive control. So it's been very successful, been applied in thousands of uh, applications throughout industry. So uh, that that's a real success. But if you go to one of these continuous operating plants and you're in a startup or a shutdown situation, what you find is, is that a good deal of the control that is normally used, that is the automatic control, is sitting in manual. And the operator is having to manually adjust many, many, many valves and be constantly trying to keep the process at a state where it's safe for operation. So this is a real challenge. And um, it's one that is just starting to be addressed. Yeah, there's a lot of motivation to improve this area. If you can think, if you're having to manually do things that are normally automatically done for you as an operator, then uh, there's a lot of chance for mistakes to be made. And a number of studies have been made of accidents that occur within the process industries. And uh, a good deal of those, the majority of the accidents occur during either startup of the process or shutdown of the process or during product transitions where you're continuously operating but you're going from manufacturing one grade of product to the other. So the vast majority of the accidents occur at that time, and yet only about 5% of the time do you spend in shutdown or startup or transition. So there's a real incentive for manufacturers as well as end users to do something about this area. 
And in uh, 2010, ISA created um, a new working group, the ISA 106 Committee, and it has the charter of addressing procedural automation for the continuous industry. So uh, it's uh, one that has uh, been very active. There are over 100 members of that committee right now, people either uh, sort of um, being an observer, uh, but there are a number of major companies that are actually contributing and are active players in this, in this uh, standard development. In uh, 2013, they issued a, their first technical report and this technical report is sort of uh, is testing the water in terms of the terminology that is being defined, the models that are being defined, and eventually, based upon feedback from this technical report, it'll become an industry standard. So this is something that's uh, in evolution. Uh, many of your major manufacturers are, are contributing in this area. Now, Dow Chemical in particular is a major player in that uh, ISA 106, and I'll be talking a little bit more about them. But they have applied automated procedures for startup, shutdown, and transition on their major units with great success. So they have a lot of experience, and they're sharing that with, uh, with the committee. If you get a hold of this technical report, and that's something that you can actually buy on the web, then uh, what you find is, is that there's a lot of similarity in some ways in the physical model that is defined for a continuous process versus a batch process. But there are differences. At the bottom level, you notice down here where then a control module is just the physical device, that is the transmitter, the valve, the physical device, not the logical control unit, the control module, which is what the ISA 88 standard called out. Also, you notice that they're defining requirement model. So if you're a process engineer and you say, I'm going to shut down my plant or I'm going to start up my plant, what are the requirements? What are the procedures that should be followed? And those are captured then in this procedural model here. And then based upon this, there's an implementation model. Okay. And there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, one of these procedural models and, and this. So um, they have uh, followed pretty much the way ISA addressed uh, clarification of procedural automation, that is defining terminology, defining models for implementation, and uh, that, that's uh, what they've been doing. Uh, if you take something like a continuous reactor, then uh, the physical devices and then the equipment and then the unit would be sort of mapped out in this way. In terms of the implementation model that was shown in terms of based upon the design requirements, you create these implementation modules. Uh, within the um, technical report, they say that this implementation module can be implemented in many ways with a sequential function chart, with a function block diagram, with just programming. Uh, they aren't uh, specific in terms of what's really required at any level. So they give you quite a bit of flexibility there. But in general, what uh, one of these uh, modules look like is that there's an event that is a command that can be from a person, it can be from a discrete input, it can be from a calculation, but eventually, or whatever triggers this, the command, then initiates execution of task. As a result of that, uh, then those tasks are performed and then there's a third step that's pretty important, verification that the step has been completed, that is, the task has been completed. So in general, uh, all implementation modules must do this command, perform, and verify. You notice within here, there's the human interface. And it's possible that not only the interface, but all the tasks are really done by a person. That is, this is a totally manual procedure that is being done. 
in general, the uh, standard calls out the fact that you can have an uh, implementation module that is totally manual, that is it's the responsibility of the operator to do that particular step in terms of the uh, startup or shutdown. It could be computer assisted where part of the tasks are done by the control system, part are done by an operator. And so you start to see this importance of that interface of the operator into the implementation because at one, one point in the implementation, it may require a manual verification in the field or a manual action in the field and that then gets verified through that human interface. So uh, rather than it being totally automatic in terms of the inputs, uh, they can also be from a person there. And uh, the highest level would be fully automated. And uh, you know, if we look at batch operations, fully automated has been achieved in a lot of cases in what they do in terms of procedural automation. The technical report really uh, focuses a lot on automated uh, procedures. So they're focusing a lot on what's required here, but they also address these areas as well. So in terms of how to implement those uh, procedures, uh, one of the things that Dow contributed to this effort is the concept of uh, state-driven. So state-based control Whereas part of your definition in terms of the uh, startup or shutdown, you describe different operating states of the process and your actual logic is based upon those state definitions. And your transition from one state to the other is part of your procedures that you define. So by logically structuring things in a state manner, it, it makes the uh, design and implementation of the logic associated with startup shutdown to be much, much clearer. Where do these uh, implementation modules run? Well, the uh, technical report says they could be just in an application server. That's something that you'll find oftentimes in most of these control systems where we run things that aren't standard things in the controller, you put them up there or they can actually run at the controller level. So it's pretty much up to the manufacturer as to the support they provide and where this uh, automation will be implemented. Now Dow Chemical has written a lot of uh, articles, a lot of information produced it in terms of presentations about the benefit of procedural automation and what they have seen within their plants through automation. They have documented savings both in maintenance, startup and shutdown, being faster, more consistent, reducing the number of operator errors that are made in startup, shutdown, or, or maintenance efforts. Initially, they did a lot of this work with their Mod 5 system. They actually designed their own control system because they thought their requirements were so specific in terms of automation that they designed their own. But since then, they've really transitioned over to the ABB platform. And so they're currently using that in terms of their procedural automation. And just in one example, I found uh, they claimed like a 16% profit increase just due to automating one of the uh, maintenance um, procedures that are associated with one of their continuous units. Now then, a number of uh, companies have been looking at this area and have been uh, applying this, even though it's just a technical report, they've taken it fairly serious and have implemented it. So one of those examples would be CHS. Uh, it's one of the, the largest cooperative refinery in uh, the US. So it's a pretty, pretty large installation there. And um, one of their engineers there sort of gave me this feedback in terms of what they've seen in terms of improvement. But basically, they've seen uh, more consistency and startup shutdown, less operator errors, and by doing this, freeing up the operator to do other things rather than him being the, the thing that requires the automation. And just to show you a few examples from CHS, uh, in this big refinery, there's an area called uh, a coke drum 
And over a period of time, this uh, material builds up within the coke drum. And at some point, they have to shut down one of the drums. They have two drums. So they continue operation with the other drum while they're cleaning out the first one. So it's uh, an online uh, operation. And it involves steaming and quenching before they can actually remove this material that has built up. And uh, so in this particular case, they automated that operation, that cleaning operation, the steaming and quenching, uh, just with a, a sequential function chart. Of the cleaning or routine uh, maintenance that's being done, and if something happens that's unusual, be able to intervene and uh, save the, the situation. So uh, there's a lot of thought that goes behind the design and it's an area that requires a lot of research and development, how best to show the state-driven procedural automation. So I think we'll probably see improvements in that in the future. Another area that they addressed was fired heaters. In a refinery, you have a number of heaters that are gas-fired usually, or and the startup and shutdown of that can be fairly tricky because it's a combustible process. Uh, you just can't do things out of sequence in terms of startup. So they have totally automated startup shutdown of their uh, of their fired heaters, and in that case, they actually used function blocks for that. In this particular case, some of these function blocks are actually blocks that were originally designed for safety systems, because in safety systems you have a lot of the um, same kind of uh, requirements for state-driven kind of control. And so by using function blocks, they were able to do that. And uh, lastly, uh, they uh, automated uh, their compressor startup and shutdown. Uh, these compressors are quite something if you see them. Uh, in this case, it was like a 6,000 horsepower motor driving this compressor. So, you know, with that, that amount of uh, energy, that amount of material, you really can't make mistakes because things break pretty easily if you do. And so they have automated the startup and shutdown of their, uh, of their compressor. And in that particular case, then, that was done, again, with a sequential function chart. Hopefully these examples uh, help sort of uh, visualize, you know, where, where this is used and how it can be used in a process operation. So you say, well, why, why isn't everyone doing this? Why aren't you doing all plants automatic in terms of startup shutdown? Well, one of the big problems of doing that is, is that in many cases, the valves, the blocking valves in a continuous process are manually opened or closed. And the reason for that is, is that a plant may be running for two or three years between shutdowns. With that infrequency of actually having to do anything, it's really difficult to justify putting automatic actuators on the valves. So it requires a person out in the field to do it. Now, as you can imagine, someone scurrying around in the field opening and closing valves, uh, there's a lot of chance for mistakes, especially if you haven't done that for two years. You know, you're not really practiced in it, right? So there's a lot of opportunity for uh, problems there. Now on really critical valves, one of the things you can now do today that we couldn't do just a few years ago is you can put in a wireless uh, valve position monitor. So you can determine has someone actually manually opened or closed that valve. If you want to spend more money and actually put an actuator on the valve, you can actually wirelessly actuate the valve open or closed. So through technology, it helps in certain situations, but not all, because you can't afford to do that everywhere. Also, in a startup situation, you may need to know is the level of a certain vessel at a certain point, uh, is the pressure at a certain point, and those indications may not be brought into the control system. They may only be useful in a startup situation, and they're indicated by a local gauge on the actual uh, vessel or pipe. So in those cases, you know, can now add in actual measurements that go back to the control room wirelessly without having to run wiring. And so fairly inexpensively, you can now have those things and then further use that in the automation of the startup or shutdown. 
One of the biggest things that's happened, though, is the fact that today you can now actually use a tablet out in classified areas. Uh, this wasn't true about six years ago. Uh, we wanted to do that, but uh, not possible because uh, the devices you could buy on the market just weren't classified to be operating in a hazardous area like uh, Class 1 Div 2. But today you can. Now then, if you think about that, what does that mean? Well, it means that person that's out in the field who's manually opening and closing a valve can actually verify he's done that. That's part of our procedural automation, right? The verification. He can manually verify that quickly using a tablet. Now, the challenge here is, is how do you design the operator interface and the field person's interface where the two are linked together, where verification of operations in the field are an integral part of your procedural automation. So that's a, an area for research, area for development by all manufacturers, and a lot of room for improvement in that area. But this is just one example of a, one of these tablets that is uh, already uh, certified to work in uh, classified areas. So you say, what other challenges are there? Well, there are a number of them. One of them is, is that your least expensive way to measure flow within a process is to put in an orifice plate that provides a restriction in the flow line, and then measure the differential pressure across this. Taking the square root of the differential pressure gives you the flow. So you can get uh, an indication of flow by just putting in this restriction. So it's the least expensive way to measure flow. But you notice uh, down at the very bottom end of the range, if you're looking at differential pressure, you get to a point where the flow measurement really isn't believable. And so you see a plant, especially during plant startup, where flow loops are on manual. And the main reason is they can't believe the flow measurement. You have to get up to a certain throughput before the actual flow measurement becomes believable. So this causes lots of issues in terms of plant startup. You'll usually see double, triple, quadruple the number of people in the control room during startup just because things have to go into manual because you can't believe the flow measurements themselves. Now, in certain cases, you can sort of get around this problem of the flow measurement. Say on a, a boiler, you have something called three element feed water flow control. It's just a cascade control. Where at the bottom, you have the feed water flow. When you're heating up a boiler on startup, it may take many, many hours. And during that time frame, that flow measurement is fairly useless. Now, you may have a good level measurement, but if that's broken, that is, you can't really use it at that point, what do you do? Well, if you don't do anything, the operator has to manually adjust that valve. This is an integrating process, so it's a thing you can't walk away from. You know, it's, a, it's just an issue. What you'd really like to be able to do is just sort of degrade the control down to single element where level control is just directly adjusting the valve. Now, fortunately, if a person has implemented uh, control using foundation field bus devices, one of the standard features of a block is something called bypass. And essentially, it allows you to essentially pass directly through the valve as though that wasn't there. So this allows you to sort of get around that kind of an issue. There may be other things or other techniques that could be used. Again, a, a wonderful area for research of what do you do when you can't use the measurement that you're um, normally using. Other challenging area is the area of uh, the install characteristics of your valves within the plant. When you commission a plant, normally you commission the control, that is you set the tuning of your PID controllers based upon operating at some normal operating condition. When you're in a startup or shutdown situation, you may be very far away from that normal operating condition. And in many cases, you may find the valve has nonlinear install characteristics. So what happens is something that runs quite well up in one region at lower throughputs suddenly goes into oscillation, go unstable. 
And so in many cases, then you'll find at low throughputs on a plant, operators having to put things onto manual because the control isn't tuned for that operating region. The gain, process gains change dramatically. One way to address that, and this right here shows you know, what would happen as you sort of decrease and you have nonlinear install characteristics, you almost go unstable at the lower end here. One of the ways to address that is to actually identify the process model as the control loop is running. That is to save models of your process at different operating points. And that's very, very feasible to do today. That's being done in some systems today. And so we're capturing the process model at different points. One way of doing that is using this uh, model switching with recentering and interpolation. It's a, a technique that Willy Wojnarz actually uh, invented here uh, and very successful in terms of being able to use that for online identification of the process at the controller level. Uh, using that technique then you can have series of models at different operating points and look at how the process gain dynamics change with operating region that you're in. And then based upon um, what's called the state parameter, that is the driving force for change. And in many cases, this is just the valve position, but it may be another parameter. Uh, if you're dealing with a pH loop, it may be pH is the driving factor. So you have a concept of some parameter that's driving change and the dynamics are gain. You can then uh, break up the operating region and uh, then the model that applies in each region can then be automatically applied in the control. So you get good control over your entire region, even though you have these dramatic changes and dynamics are gain within your process. So that's another tool uh, that's available. Now, one of the things that this uh, sequential chart doesn't do for you is to handle dynamics well. It, it does a very good job in terms of the sequential function chart saying, at this point, I need to open this valve. At this point, I need to change the set point to that. But the dynamics of the process handling those and the interactions between control, uh, really not such a great tool for that. And so a combination of sequential function chart with model predictive control can oftentimes be used then to handle the transitions that occur online on your process. If I miss. Okay. Uh, so this uh, is just one example on a divided wall column where 10% throughput and almost no change in the key quality parameters. Uh, there's a presentation by Willie later today on that, so if you'd like to know more about that, that'll be there. Similar to batch, uh, you have the problem of oftentimes you don't know what the final product is. You have to go to the lab to find out the qualities. And so again, applying analytics, you can um, do a good job in terms of estimating the product quality online in a continuous fashion and detecting faults. The uh, issue of continuous though is different than in batch. In batch you can use something called multi-way PCA PLS that uses sort of the profile of the batch parameters over the batch as your mean values of those values. In continuous, you really don't have any mean value for your operating parameters. They change night and day from one instance to another. And so you have to have another technique for doing that. Mm -hmm. One way of doing that is defining something called state parameters, where you're then breaking things into states in terms of the operation. And an example of that is where we applied uh, this uh, continuous analytics on a uh, refrigeration system where we had a uh, a massive a compressor, looking at efficiency. So uh, we had a first principle model of the actual compressor online. So I had a continuous indication of efficiency, but you really didn't have a good indication of what was causing a problem if the efficiency dropped off. 
So uh, we actually trained uh, the model for both qual the prediction that is efficiency and also then could use that model in terms of determining the contributing factors if efficiency dropped off. The other thing that was done there was estimation of product viscosity. Their viscosity analyzer just was not that reliable over the operating range they were operating. We we're making like 35 different products. And so, uh, and there's about a two hour delay between changes on the front end and getting here. So having a continuous estimation of things was something that we thought would be of value. And in fact, both the efficiency prediction and the other versus the actual lab sample, or in this case, the first principle model was uh, fairly, fairly good. So these tools can be quite effective. Again, you know, the real issue is how do you make them easy? How do you make them easy to maintain as well as design? One of the things that is changing technically, and we'll talk a little bit about that later in the panel, is technology is really going to change the system of the future. Uh, all you have to do is look at the cost of storage, look at the cost of memory, and you say, wow, there have been big changes here. And in many cases, your manufacturer, your control system is way behind in terms of keeping up with that but it's, it's coming in terms of that. And by taking advantage of that, you actually then have the ability to collect this information that would be needed for these models for prediction of quality and fault detection. Today, uh, believe it or not, person actually has to configure a historian to say, I'd like to sample this, I'd like to sample that. And oftentimes uh, sampled at such a slow rate because those, many of those archiving uh, applications were designed when storage was actually expensive. And uh, so they use compression, which really makes the data fairly useless from uh, applying it in analytics. But uh, that can change. And in a few cases, you see historians now that are actually using some of the newer technology. Like there's one out there that is based upon Hadoop and some other technology that you find in Facebook and Yahoo and that. So it's changing, uh, not fast enough, but it will change, I think, over time. So with that uh, summary, uh, we've seen quite a bit of uh, success in terms of event processing, especially in batch and continuous. There's evolving work in that area, and there's an opportunity, I think, for everyone to contribute in terms of analysis and design of that. With process analytics, it really is a, an area that deserves more attention. It can mean a world of difference in terms of plan operation. And um, there are things happening in terms of storage and cost that uh, will eventually uh, make its way into control systems. So with that, uh, I had just um, a few references there if you want to look or read more about some of this. And with that, I think I'm through. Thank you for a very nice industrial keynote. Uh, so. Thank you.